All right. Hello and welcome to the Crypto 2023 Rump Session. I am your Rump Session Chair, so let me set the rules of how this evening is going to go. Uh, the program is available on the website, so you can see the time slots for each talks. The actual times, of course, will probably drift a little bit, but the increment of how many minutes per talk we will, we will stick to. Uh, when you have one minute left, I will flash a sign at you that says you have one minute left. When you have no time left, you will hear a saxophone start playing. Okay, it's quite pleasant. You can demonstrate. Okay, so that's your that's a reminder. Now, if you go past the saxophone, you will hear my trumpet playing, and I will warn you, my dog leaves the room reliably when I do this. Uh, so it's not quite as pleasant. And if you go even beyond that, Britta has given me a taser that makes an, an incredible sound. Um, so let's not find out. Let's stick to only the trumpet if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, so for our first talk of the rump session, we would like to bring up our program chairs. Uh, for the Crypto 2023 PC chair report. So Elena is sitting right here and uh, I will see if we can drag her on stage towards the end of the report. Thanks. Oh. Not yet. Yeah. Wait, is, uh, nope. Oh, this one, okay. That, no, oops. Uh, okay. Okay, so we wanna start with the thank yous. So first of all, we want to thank our Record high uh, PC of 102 people. Uh, they were all amazing. Um, <laughs> you can, those of you who are here, please stand up. Like everybody who started on the PC, please stand up if you're here. Okay, I guess our PC is for the most part enjoying the, the well-deserved RAM session. That's good. They don't need to hear this report. <laughs> okay, we also had area chairs. That was... Uh, um, we had a lot of submissions, so luckily we had wonderful area chairs, so we used divide and conquer. Uh, we had six areas, and they're all over there, and corresponding to each area, we had a lovely chair, and everything was great, and we really would like to thank them. Um, and also, of course, we want to thank 500 sub-referees for our papers, for our submissions. Our general chair, Britta Hale, who made this uh, this run <laughs> um our workshop chair alessandra scafuro is alessandra here thank you so much <laughs> um our rum session chair allison in addition to all of her other duties <laughs> then we also had a small committee of people we drafted early on so we could run our decisions by them before we even put everything together so we want to, th they know who they are, so I'm not going to go through the names. Then we also had people we, you know, out of 102 people, it's hard to make decisions. So people who had opinions about awards, we definitely tapped into them and we thank them. Uh, people who contributed to selecting our invited speaker, thank you very much. And also, of course, very special thank you to Kermit and Martine, Eurocrypt PC co-chairs, uh, because we basically tried to copy everything they did. Um, so, you know, that's because I think Eurocrypt was very successful. And uh, so we took a lot of their wisdom. Okay. And of course, we must thank all the authors who submitted all the papers. There were 479 of them. 124 got accepted, which resulted in 122 uh, presentations because uh, two pairs of papers were soft mergers. And of course, last but not least on this slide, uh, with huge thanks to Kevin and Kay, uh, without whom everything would just crash and we wouldn't have anything running at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, speaking of growth, uh, so this is a nice illustration of how our field is growing because this chart is uh, just the number of crypto submissions. So as you can see, the number we received this year is record high at 479. Uh, so what happened to those submissions? Um, so this is our review process. It's double blind, as in we don't know who the authors are and uh, the, uh, the authors don't know who the reviewers are. Uh, 
Well, we the chairs know, but the reviewers don't know. Um, and um, we also uh, made sure we paid very close attention to uh, not put people in a conflict of interest situation. Um, and also the program committee members had a limit on how many submissions uh, they could have. Um, so uh, the review process started with an, the individual review phase where uh, pe uh, the papers were reviewed just without, there's no discussion. You don't see how what other people think about the paper. Um, then there was an initial discussion and we had an early reject phase. And at this stage, 95% of the papers who were rejected at this point got at least three reviews, some got more. Uh, then after this initial discussion, some the majority of the two thirds of the papers proceeded to rebuttal. Uh, so the authors could respond to whatever concerns were raised in the initial reviews. Uh, then there was an additional three weeks of discussion. It's actually rounded down. It was a little bit more than that. Um, and all remaining papers received at least three reviews. And there was a lot of discussion um, so the largest, the longest discussion thread had 56 comments, which is, in my opinion, a lot. And all, and in the end of this very long discussion, the paper did get in. So it's not true that long discussions don't, <laughs> don't result in a good outcome. And um, the median number of, of uh, discussion um, items were, was 10. So there was substantial discussion. Um, so in the end, we had more than 1,500 reviews, and all the comments, all the discussion comments summed up were almost 5,000. So a lot of work went into this, uh, into putting together this program. Okay, so what did it look like? So obviously, uh, so we had um, PC members contribute uh, re reviews and they kind of trickled in gradually until the individual phase deadline. So that's the blue line. And then the sub-referees typically had less work to do, but it was due earlier, so it was a little bit slightly different shape. And then after the initial discussion, we also solicited some additional reviews that came in gradually, but about a week before the decisions were due so we could discuss. Just kidding. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, uh, it didn't quite work this way, but it was okay. It all worked out. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think there were also some reviews that came in after we already made the decisions. <laughs> um, so in the end, our acceptance rate, so remember the chart where we have the growth in the number of submissions. So, uh, but you, the acceptance rate, basically we aim to keep it reasonable so that it wouldn't be brutal. So in the end, we accepted almost 26% of the papers. Okay, this is the breakdown of submissions by area. So you can see the yellow uh, slice that dominates is MPC, and then followed by public key cryptography, and then, well, you can read the slide. Um, so these are submissions, and this uh, and now this break broken down by area, and this is the acceptances broken down by area. Um, so it looks a little similar, but you, you can see this. Like, let me go back so you can see how it changed. So this is, so some slivers were slightly bigger and this is explained by the acceptance rates by area. So there's this area called other. So we have six designated areas, but if you feel your paper doesn't fit into any one of the six, you can select other. So there are seven categories and um, as I said, the acceptance rate was 26%. So some papers, so most categories were like 26 plus minus, a uh, couple of outliers. So ESI, that's um, efficient uh, implementation. So that's like the chess community. Uh, so we need more chess submissions. There were very few of them to begin with. And uh, so, you know, just one paper going whichever way affected the acceptance rate. Uh, but uh, it would be nice to get more, more submissions from the chess community um, to kind of even things out. Um, okay. So a couple more statistics. So how do you craft a, a title of a crypto paper that's, go that's going to win? Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, 
<laughs> this the slide was supposed to have animations, but I guess you got the joke with that animation. <laughs> okay, so if you are kind of inspired by this, this is actually a uh, RAM session contest to design a winning title out of these uh, using these keywords. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you have a submission, um, like a good title that uses them, uh, please uh, contact us. And I have to tell you already, like the, the, you need to design the title. And I, but I can already tell you who your co-author needs to be in order to. Um... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is b back to the keywords. <laughs> Okay, so uh, everybody who wants to participate in the contest, I trusted took a picture of the slide so I can move on. Okay, so more statistics. I don't know the answer to this question, but this was kind of fun. Um, and okay, so now the, on the only thing left to tell you that's actually substantive is as part of the review process, we did this experiment together with Eurocrypt where um, papers that are kind of really close to getting in, really good papers, but whatever it is that didn't get them over the edge to get accepted, if the committee felt that um, that these papers really should be published, they um, indicated that to the authors. So the authors at submission time to crypto had a way to signal to us that they were in that special category where Eurocrypt uh, marked them as revise and submit to crypto. And there was a reviewer that they got who was kind of sticky from the Eurocrypt process, carried over and became a crypto reviewer for the same paper who kind of was already familiar with the with the paper and with the discussion and who whose job was to see if the, the authors address the criticism. And then that um, uh, referee had the ability to advocate for the paper more successfully. Potentially, they could say this paper almost got into Eurocrypt. These were the flaws. They were addressed. I really think this paper should get in. Um, so that's kind of the idea of this uh, of the process, and the like. If we could, if this is something the community wants, and we can scale it up, that could potentially save on the reviewing effort and make the whole process a little bit less random. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more. So, I we sort of <laughs> we randomized the numbers slightly. Uh, so we had Eurocrypt identified about ten such papers. So this is an experiment that's very small scale. About seven and a half were submitted to crypto as part of the experiment, uh, and seventy percent of them got in. So this is this is not bad actually. Like, um, and uh, like it's much higher than the acceptance rate for res resubmissions in general. And then we, as part of our review process, identified f about fifteen such papers, and um, ten of them, about ten, were submitted to Asia Crypt as part of these experiments. So it's kind of ongoing. We're still trying to understand how, what, what happens as part of it. So if you have some input about this and want, think this is a good idea or a bad idea, this is one of these things to like think about and, and give feedback to the, to the chairs, to the board, kind of to the community. Okay, so um, that's, that's all I have to say about this experiment. Um, uh, so you've, you've already heard about the best papers and the clap I hope or if you haven't had a chance to clap for the best papers now's your chance to do it again <laughs> all right um same thing for the invited speakers all right <laughs> okay so then it was time to put together the program and so we as you can see we use some very high-tech tools um so uh and, and we took pictures and and uh, texted them to each other so this is how we put together this program. And the nice thing about this tool is that it generalizes to putting together the proceedings. <laughs> but Springer also requires uh, that we kind of uh, tell them in what order the papers will appear in the proceedings and, uh, and the page numbers for each paper. So that tool didn't work. So we used another very, very high tech tool. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how we got the proceedings. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Have fun. Oh, and Elena. And I also wanted to say thank you so much. It was so much fun to work with you. And likewise. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's it.
we turn this on? Ah, thank you. Ah, yes, please pay attention to who is on deck for the talk and then take the clicker and the handheld mic uh, from the previous speaker as you come up. Thank you. Um, I had a I had a more harsh version of this title, which is that some of you really suck at LaTeX. Um, so um, the, what happened was we started writing a new LaTeX class file for the new journal, Yopa and I. But by the way, he's a great collaborator. If you get a chance to work with him, you should do that. And uh, in the process of doing this, we sort of wanted to understand how people are using LaTeX and what kind of problems we would run into. So what I did was uh, I discovered after looking at some of the LaTeX that some of you like write really ugly code. So there's this thing that you may have heard of called software engineering. And maybe people in your department practice this, but you probably want to go ask them about how to write better code because some of it is pretty bad. Um, so some of the things that we found, so like, you know, I went and compiled, and th this is a horrifying thing. I'm going to need another drink after this talk, but I compiled like 200 papers that were uploaded and uh, just, just to see if they would compile, like 10% didn't even compile. What the hell are you doing uploading your paper if it doesn't even compile? And a bunch of them are missing bibliographic references. Perhaps you've heard there's a log file that tells you when you have errors and you're supposed to look at that. Just because you get a PDF doesn't mean you're done. <laughs> and there were many missing DOIs. This is really an insult to your colleagues. You know, if you don't include a DOI, they don't get, you know, they don't get credit for the citation and you really should include those. Um, one person actually required shell access in the compilation of their code, which is actually kind of amazing for a security related conference. Um, there were many use package uh, things in there for packages that you don't even use. And this is clearly a cut and paste problem. You know, just because you used a package 10 years ago doesn't mean you need to still include that. And um, there were over full H boxes more than an inch wide, which is kind of amazing. Like, don't you even look at the margins? Um, so in fairness, you know, I, I gave the first talk at Crypto 85 and actually LaTeX is about that old. You know, what piece of software do you use that's that old? It's kind of amazing. And over the years, LaTeX has created a lot of problems. It's really in sad shape. So you're not totally to blame. You know, you're working with stone tools. But I will say that, um, you know, one piece of advice I, I would give you is that um, you shouldn't just keep reusing bad packages. You know, there are all sorts of conflicts from these packages. And I was actually amazed to find that these are two different pictures of the same principle. You know, people keep repeating the same bad practices. So this is an example of that. Um, and also, if, you're, if your co-author gives you a, a macro package and said, we should use this, you might actually want to look inside to see if it, because sometimes somebody can be trying to help you in a very dangerous way. So I would try to reject some of those things. Um, these are some of the ugly things that I found in the code, but uh, I'm not gonna attribute them to any particular person. So, you know, things like multiply defined labels, if you're gonna re refer to equation five, it's kind of good to have just one equation five because it makes it much more readable. Um, you know, there are things like ends that occur inside um, if statements that just sort of, you know, you forget to put the end of the if. There there were actually uh, 25 papers that had end occurred when if true on line uh, 58. Well, 58 is not uh, universal, but that's usually because you have if LNCS, right? And, and you're LaTeX. Um, there's other things like uh, the backslash VEC. For some reason, people can't figure out how, you know, what to do about that. And there's actually an option on the LNCS style for this. And, um, the best one I found was this overfull H box. I, I don't know if you know, but uh, 72 points is an inch. So 8,000 points, that's a big ass margin. Um, so I would say that if we're gonna streamline publishing, we have to improve on this practice. And this means that authors have to be a little bit more careful in their preparation. What's gonna happen, uh, you know, you have the, the freedom to produce these beautiful documents, 
But I think people are paying too much attention to fiddling with their LaTeX and they need to concentrate more on actually producing content. Um, in the future, what's gonna happen is you're gonna upload your LaTeX and it's gonna be compiled in the cloud. ACM is already doing this and so is archive. You have to upload your LaTeX and, and it's gonna be checked in the cloud so that we don't have to go through this thing about sending you an email saying, oh, by the way, your code doesn't compile. Um, we're building a system for this. We also are going to have to streamline the handling of metadata. Tosk and Teachers are also struggling with this. So uh, Yopan actually wrote a paper on this. We submitted to the Tech User Group Journal. And so I think I, I slide that missed here. Well, anyway, there's a slide missing. I will say that you should go to publish.iacr.org. This is the system we're building for compiling LaTeX in the cloud. Go try it, try to hammer on it. Think of this as adversarial computer science. Try to break it, tell us where you can break it because we're trying to build a robust system that will compile the stuff in the cloud and extract metadata. Thank you. is dead. Is there a switch? Yep. Hello. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's see how this works. Okay, so we are here to present the traditional uh, NIST crypto update at Crypto 2023. We have uh, seven updates to give, so we'll, we will be going at a fast pace. I will give the first three uh, projects, and then John will continue. So uh, NIST is committed to review uh, their own uh, standards and looking at standards that are over five years old. The scope of this project is to review federal information processing standards in special publications. And as a result of this review, uh, some decision may emerge like reaffirm, update, revise, convert, or withdraw. Currently, there are three documents open for uh, public review, which are listed here. One of them is about key derivation functions, and then two others are about SHA-3. One of them is the SHA-3 standard, and the other one is SHA-3 derived functions. So if you're interested in this, take a look, uh, and you may provide public comments. Uh, also, uh, two, quick, two quick notes here. There are um, TDEA and SHA-1 uh, are in the process of being deprecated, and so there's a transition period. And uh, so by January 1st, 2024, TDEA will be drawn and there's there will be a, a transition strategy created to uh, get rid of SHA-1 and eventually FIPS 180-5 will be published by removing SHA-1. Okay, moving forward, there's a project at NIST called the uh, Multi-Party Threshold Cryptography. Um, the main activity right now is to promote a call for multi-party threshold schemes. There's a draft published in January. Uh, we will. This is basically looking to collect uh, reference specifications and implementations on various primitives, including multi-party computation, fully amorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs. There will be a workshop later in September, uh, namely to collect uh, comments by the community. And we currently have two documents in draft, one about threshold at DSA Schnorr and the other one, the actual call that we hope to publish the final version in the end of the year. Uh, in 2024, second half will be the, the deadline to submit threshold schemes. You can look, you can subscribe the forum for announcements and discussions. And then we have a privacy enhancing cryptography project whose goals are to accompany emerging uh, privacy enhancing cryptography and promote development of corresponding reference material. One of our activities is to organize what we call the special topics on privacy and public auditability, where we host talks by external experts. We've had three of those events since last crypto. All material is online, you can, you can check it out. Uh, and this project is also engaged with the threshold uh, call, uh, namely with respect to exploring MPC, FHE, zero knowledge proofs, attribute based encryption, etc. You can subscribe to the PEC forum for further announcements and discussion. Hello? Okay, so I'll talk about the last three, I think, or four things. Um, so first of all, we've kind of been going with the post-quantum uh, crypto, not competition, but it's kind of a competition. We didn't call it that. Um, so we are, let me see if I've got a laser pointer. Oh, I do, cool. Okay, so what we've done here is we finished the third round. Um, we're in the pro process of getting our FIPS um, draft standards out. So um, we're going to be having, hopefully, like in two days, I think, um, we're going to have the draft for uh, Kyber, the Kyber spec. Um, and it'll be public 
comment on that. And then we've got kind of in the in the pipeline, we've got the spec for uh, Dilithium for Falcon. Those are both lattice based signatures, and Sphinx Plus, which is a really cool stateless hash based signature scheme. Um, and then um, we have these candidates. Uh, we have the fourth round. Uh, we had a few things that we thought we weren't quite ready to standardize because maybe they need a little more thought. That turned out to be a good idea. And um, but and so um, there are still some of these left. Um, we may eventually standardize a, one of these from one of these. Um, we also have the on ramp for more post quantum signatures. We've got like forty submissions. These are really these are like some really interesting, innovative um, post quantum signature schemes. I invite you to. Uh, Follow up on any of this. Uh, we have the PQC forum if you want to yell at people about post quantum crypto, and we also have a workshop. So, um, otherwise, the lightweight competition just finished. Um, we chose Ascon, and um, it was also a very nice algorithm, by the way. Um, and so we are uh, we're trying to get a draft standard out for this in 2023. This is basically an a AAD lightweight AAD scheme, and it also has a Zoff really a hash function, but it was a Zoff, so it's got variable length. Um, and you can see the the forum you can go to for more information on this. Um, random bit generation is something I've been doing basically forever, um, one coin flip at a time, yeah. And so a uh, big thing is 90C is coming, is coming out. We already had a draft of this. We added some additional stuff with RBC, RBGC, which is chains of RBGs, is important for software. So that's coming out very soon as a, as a draft. We have to get public comments on it and get it out, out the door, hopefully late this year, early next year. Um, and then we also have um, ongoing work with BSI to try to align the standards. This is something we've been doing for a few years now. And these seem, we seem to be, I think, making some progress and making it possible to get one device through both. Um, and then there's this modes of operation thing. This is basically an attempt to develop a variable length tweakable block cipher up to very large lengths. So you can follow up on this and that's really all I've got. So thank you very much. Should I click forward? Dear colleagues, we would like to propose a change to the review process used by the ICR for its conferences and journals. We feel like the current system does not benefit our community and we'd like to put forward an alternative. In the current system, there's a high variance in review quality and conclusions, and it's often not clear to authors why their work is being rejected. Indeed, sometimes there even are no good reasons. This is a symptom of several critical shortcomings which are inherent to our current system. These include lack of transparency, lack of fairness, ownership ambiguity in disputes, and inefficient use of our valuable time and resources. Now the consequences of these shortcomings are many, including impeded innovation, the risk of being scooped from concurrent work, as well as anxiety, sadness, and fear in authors and reviewers alike. My fellow academics, we are living in a time of crisis, a time when our work is being ignored, rejected, or distorted by a system that does not serve us, a system that is controlled by a few powerful entities that dictate what is accepted and what is rejected, a system that is corrupt, inefficient, and biased. The current academic review process is controlled by a select few gatekeepers who determine the fate of research papers, stifling innovation and progress. But we have the power to change this. We have the power to create a new system that is transparent, consensus-based, and decentralized. <laughs> Transparency means that reviewers cannot hide behind anonymity or confidentiality. We can publish our papers and reviews on a public ledger that records every in interaction. This way, we can increase the accountability and credibility of the reviewers and authors and allow anyone to verify the quality and originality of the submitted paper. 
Decentralization means that we do not need to rely on any gatekeepers or intermediaries to publish our work. Instead of peer review, we can use a peer-to-peer -peer network of reviewers who can verify and validate each other's work. This way we can eliminate the risk of censorship, fraud, or manipulation. Consensus means that we do not need to follow the opinions of a few elites or experts. We can use a consensus mechanism that ensures that the majority of the reviewers agree on the validity and value of the work. This way we can prevent the domination of any single group or ideology and foster a more democratic and diverse academic community. This is the vision that we have for the future of academia a future that is not plagued by centralization and inefficiencies. A future where researchers publish their work directly onto the blockchain. In this decentralized academic utopia, incentives that could be aligned through tokenization, rewarding both reviewers and authors with tokens for their contributions and advancements of knowledge. Blockchain is not only the future of money, but also the future of academia. So join us in this revolution. Join us in creating a new system that is open, fair, and efficient. Join us in making academia great again. Thank you. I don't know if my talk is supposed to be funny now. <laughs> it it won't be, I'm sorry. Okay. Hi, hi all. So I'm here to advertise Latin Crypt 2023. Um it's gonna take place in Quito, Ecuador, October from the 22nd to the 6th. And we also have a couple of schools. We have the AES Crypto School, Advanced Topics in Cryptography. That's like a usual school as we know it in English for a broader audience in the crypto community but also we have the Inca Crypto School for Introductory School in Cryptography, which is, uh, most of it is gonna be in Spanish and we already have about 100 students uh, from the region registered. So that's already, I would say, very successful and thank you, it means a lot to us. Okay, so I want to give you a few reasons why you would like to attend, besides perhaps changing the Santa Barbara landscape for a while. And then, for example, Ecuador is very fun and beautiful. I think uh, I personally like it a lot, even though I haven't been there. And the food, the food is good. The food in Latin America in general is good and diverse. And also very importantly, there are a few visa restrictions. Uh, there are only a few countries that cannot attend, but the visa process is, is not dehumanizing at all. So traveling is cheap. So if your employer won't uh, allow it, you can definitely pay for this yourself. Uh, these prices here are like for the full, for the full five nights, and this is like meals you can go out in a street food car and get a meal for like three dollars. So it's like that's pretty good. And we are very close to many other uh, paradise places around. So in case you want a tour, I know a lot of people here will go. Or, I'll, I'll, okay, I love people with exaggeration. I know three or four people who will go to um, Joseph Miti afterwards. Uh, well, here you can try other things as well. Uh, just to show a few examples, but I think it's a, a very encouraging reason to go. Now, I don't think these are the only reasons to attend a conference like Latin Crypt. Uh, I would like to quote this, uh, uh, this sentence from old philosopher Diego Araña, talent is uniformly distributed, but opportunities are not. And I think we need to bring the knowledge to these regions that are not on the table all the time in our discussions. So, we want to create this school, as, as we have mentioned, one of them is almost uh, complete in Spanish, we already have 100 students, but we need the help of many of you. So you can support us by attending, this is a big thing, we really want to have a big participation, we really want students to be able to connect with fellow researchers, with the outside community, with the international uh, audience, but we also need sponsorships for the event, we, any kind of help actually helps. So we need help with infrastructure. Every time we set this up, we needed, in this case, we needed to set up an NGO, a bank account, registration platform, websites, and more. And we need to do this every time that this is 
well, that this is uh, planned. So I think this is really a big deal. We do it with uh, only a few resources, only a few people, like we, we collaborate with the local community. So I think this is, every time we get to do this is a big achievement. So any help is welcome. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yushin, and uh, I'm going to provide some technical support for the IAC annual reviewing process. Um, sorry, I'm joking. Uh, so this is actually a serious talk, and uh, uh, this this, uh, this presentation is about the permissionless consensus in expected constant time. And this is a joint work with uh, Juan Garay and uh, Agalos Kiayas. So here uh, we are interested in consensus, also known as Byzantine agreement. And this is a task where some parties, they would like to uh, agree on an output. And uh, if they start unanimously, then the output should be the, their input. So here we are interested in the round complexity of the Byzantine agreement protocols. And it is known that uh, for deterministic synchronous protocols, you need uh, at least T plus one rounds this is a lower bound where T is the number of the corrupted parties. Uh, and uh, it is also known that this lower bound can be overcome by using randomization. And uh, Fieldman and Mikali give the first uh, randomized BA protocol that terminates in expected constant time. So here, uh, the termination is probabilistic and uh, non simultaneous, which means that honest parties might terminate at dif different rounds. Uh, however, we also want to note here that uh, this protocol can have simultaneous termination by running it for polylog kappa runs, where kappa is the security parameter. And by doing so, uh, the running time is, is uh, the run complexity is still independent of the number of the parties, but you get simultaneous termination. So here we are interested in permissionless BA protocols. And uh, all the traditional protocols, they do not run in this setting, they run in a permission setting which means that the number of the parties, they are hard-coded in this protocol. And uh, although this, these protocols, they, they still allow for parties to join and leave, but uh, if this happens, then all the honest parties, they have to update their local configurations. And uh, this is different from the permissionless protocols like blockchains where parties can join and leave without notifying anyone else. And, uh, uh, no, and uh, no honest parties need to update their internal state if new parties join or the existing party leaves. So here, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, he has a suggestion for doing permissionless Byzantine agreement uh, by using blockchains. However, his original suggestion only tolerates like uh, one third of the corrupted uh, computational power. And uh, it is later improved by this paper, this GKR paper, and it gives the first permissionless honest majority proof of work based Byzantine agreement. So here, the interesting thing is that in the classical setting, we first have the expected constant around the non-simultaneous termination protocol, and uh, we run it for polylog runs, and we get uh, simultaneous termination. However, in the permissionless setting, we only have this polylog round, simultaneous termination protocol, uh, and if you reduce the, the running time of this GK, GKR protocol, you get nothing. So here, this is a motivation for our work. We are looking for the expected constant around the permissionless protocols. And here we have some constructions by using the parallel chains. So uh, this parallel chain is uh, implemented by using the M41 proof of work. And the intuition here is that parallel chains can dilute the power of the adversary. So that even if you have a distinguished chain, which is the first chain, the adversary would not be able to focus on this chain and attack it. So we also combine this uh, parallel chain structure with some classical BA protocols to get uh, uh, expected constant time permissionless consensus. And uh, here's some applications of our protocol. So first, by using sequential compositions, we can convert this one short uh, consensus protocol to a permissionless distributed ledger, which can confirm transactions in expected constant time. And uh, it can have consistency parameter, which is asymptotically better than any existing protocol. And also we can use this to implement permissionless clock synchronization with better, uh, or to say the optimal clock skews. Yeah, 
and uh, the paper will come soon on ePrint. Yeah, and uh, that's it. Thanks. Um, uh, no, I am actually not going to be presenting slides. Um, so I wanted to actually, Kathy, I see you just came up to the front row. I would also like to invite you to come up here. Um, it is Kathy's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy did not know this was going to be happening. Um, I would also like to invite Kathy's friends. <laughs> um, we're going to sing Kathy happy birthday. Um, at least... <laughs> I would like to invite you to help us sing Kathy Happy Birthday because you really don't want to hear me sing a cappella. Uh. <laughs> and if you're one of the 0 0.79 people in the same birthday pigeonhole as Kathy, feel free to accept it as well. Please come up, please come up. I was told we would have music. Happy birthday, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is too rough. Okay. I think they need two. We need two. We need two. One. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Change. <laughs> Stop and change. Stop and change. Sorry. Do you want the slides? Um, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, no, no, no. We need to switch out of this PDF. Yeah, it's time. Yeah, yeah. Um, And we need to go into a PowerPoint that's on the desktop. Desktop. Yeah, it's called Ken Song. Let's make sure we put it at the beginning slide before we share it. And then, uh, once it starts, it will be fine because it's on. Yeah, don't click it. once it starts. Once we uh, let it show up on the stage. First. Okay, so you want me to put it up right when you go to stage? Yeah. yeah, you can put it up now. Just put it in slideshow and then start once we're ready. Okay. Is this on? Okay. Yep. Hello. <laughs> Not projecting. Uh, All right. We're here to present a retrospective on the 2023 crypto review process. Our slides are timed, so we have to just wait for them to click. <laughs> Uh, so what you're about to see is a reenactment of two crypto submissions finding out that they were rejected. I don't know who I am anymore if I'm not a crypto paper. It's always crypto paper. It's never just paper. <laughs> oh, and we don't have the sound. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> It should be playing through the laptop. Yeah, there's sound embedded in Technical the PowerPoint. Technical difficulties. Hold Don't on. worry, the timer is still going. Uh. Okay, yeah, now go back, go back a slide and then click it. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. Go. Anyway. Doesn't seem to matter what I do. It's always reviewer two who didn't read or understand. Oh, why? Why make comments that are so inane? Driving me insane. But my rebuttal must be polite. Though I see this, I would fight. Because I reject 
anywhere else I'd be except is it my destiny to live and die on Eprint for eternity? I reject where I claim you they see a stretch. But will it take for them to see the pub behind the duck and fight for me? I want to know, know what the format is like if I'm published in Springer. Do, do I compile? Am I not hot with my margin so hulking? And with my page cap limited down to exclude everything? I know LNCS. Can you feel any printer G? Unpublished e printer G. Can you feel e printer G? Unpublished e printer G. <laughs> I'm reject where to else I be except. Was it my destiny to live and die on e-print for eternity? I'm reject where I claim you stay see a stretch. What will it take for them to see the pub behind the dust and fight for me? I'm reject. And I'm great at proving stuff. So hey, check my proofs, yeah, I'm reject. I'm reject. And so am I. But you're unpublished and in mine. So hey, world, read my proofs, yeah, I'm reject. Maybe I'm re and now we will have a short break It doesn't work. Yep, click on it. This is wrong. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Nice quick break. You just get out the door and uh, can sprint back in. So, if you remember, we had a conference game and there was a promised award at the end of this. So, time to take a look. What was the secret behind the logo? As I said, not just encoded plain text. So there are five key, no pun intended, items to identify as part of the logo. And there were multiple hints given. The very first hint was that everything was conference themed. 
not necessarily security based. Uh, in fact, definitely not security based. So let's go through the answers first of all, and then we have an award and a winner for you. The answer to the plain text was crypto 2023. That's if you get conference theme, that's a good place to start. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The key, well, it was the organization. The hint was what had been started in 82. That was the IACR. We had the IV, which is the location. And yeah, the hints were, you kind of had to guess, by the way, which one was which. We had some people, I will note, we had a lot of very creative cryptanalysis going on. Uh, it was a lot of brute force. People would kind of like fill in all fields. And I think there were some scripts written to try to automate this process, looking at the timestamps. So you know, kudos for that, well done. Uh, it got interesting trying to identify what counts as the uh, winner, but uh, very nice. The cipher, now this one's nice getting the fun part. What's the cipher? Two fish. And okay, yeah, we can debate two fish, but you know, life could have been worse, right? All right, so, and last but not least is the encryption mode, which was, again, remember it's conference themed, output feedback mode, get it? You know you get it, come on. <laughs> So if you have the research output and you're looking for feedback when you submit a paper, you got to play this one. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I'm trying. But it's trying. <laughs> okay, so our winner. We do have a lead winner for this, and that is Lucas Dennis. So if we have Lucas Dennis in the room, please come up. We have an award for you. And the award this year for winning the conference game is the Crypto 2023 Rum Session Golden Shrimp Award. Congratulations. <laughs> we did have a runner up, I will say. So it was a very close call at the end. And so there is actually one other name I want to call up, uh, Aldo. Gunsting, are we in the room? We are, come on up. Uh, Aldo was very close runner up, so it's not the full golden shrimp. Instead, for you, we have the half-eaten golden shrimp award. <laughs> All right, next speaker. You have to change out the slides. Doing yeah. All right. Do we have the next speaker? Hold on. Quick technical uh, switch here. Okay. So next, right? Yeah. Just click through that. That right? Yeah. Back. So is Thomas here? He's the next speaker. Uh, do we have Thomas? in the audience for Salsa Verde. Going once, Thomas, going twice. All right, we are skipping Salsa Verde. Do we have, uh, do we have the next speaker after that? Um, can we project on the screen too? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. So this is a kind of a serious talk, but it's very, very short. So I'm gonna be giving like a bit of a teaser for a paper that me and three other coworkers worked on and we presented at MathCrypt on Saturday. So can anybody tell me what this function is? Just shout it out. <laughs> okay, so those of you who said Gaussian, you know, good guess, right? But you're wrong, you're wrong. 
it's actually the derivative of a function that I did not mention before. Um, and that function is, of course, the key to our paper. Uh, but it looks a lot like a Gaussian. You can see it's a little bit taller, maybe at the tip, um, but it looks very similar. This green is uh, the difference um, scaled up to become visible. So why did we bother basically drawing two lines on top of each other and then calling it a paper, right? The point is, this is the function, that's f. Um, the point is, we can use f sort of as a CDF of a normal distribution, and we can take discrete Gaussian samples um, so our distribution is that error there, and then we are sort of adding a center and rounding. So we can take discrete Gaussian samples using either inversion sampling or rejection sampling. Um, and to find out how, read our paper. And that is the end of my presentation. You're next. I'm next. I'm next. Yeah. Nope, I'm holding on to everything. Okay. I just need a gripping hand. Have my own timer. All right. So this is serious talk. Hi, I'm Brian. You saw me earlier. I'm not asking for money. I'm not talking about money. I have a beer in one hand and my clicker. Um, I am here to talk about the Multiparty Computation Alliance, the MPC Alliance, which some of you may have heard of. Some of you may actually be members, but I am the new executive director of the MPC Alliance. So this is. This is my post-retirement job. Um, the MPC Alliance exists to accelerate awareness in multi-party computation, acceptance, and adoption. That means we are a forum for folks doing MPC work to come together to talk to each other, to advocate for MPC, to help educate regulators, legislators, anybody else who thinks they understand the technology. Uh, to try to make sure bad regulations don't get happen, to provide input to standards organizations, things like that. Some of the things we have done is organize our own events. We also participate in other events. We do a lot of standards contributions to ISO and elsewhere, and we provide feedback to folks like Congress in the United States, the ICO office in places, all in the furtherance in a nonpartisan vendor neutral manner to represent the community. Uh, upcoming things that we're gonna be doing in the Alliance that might be of interest to folks in this room, we're gonna be looking at standard processes for coordinating responsible disclosure to our members. There have been some attacks recently, including one most recently a Black Hat on commonly used MPC software. And one of the things we think we can do in the Alliance is help coordinate vulnerability disclosure to all of our members because uh, if you've ever been on the receiving end of a vulnerability disclosure impacting an open source software package that you and 17,000 other people happen to all have slightly different forks of, you know that's not the easiest thing to deal with. Uh, we're gonna be putting out some educational white papers to try to educate the broader community on the wonderfulness of MPC. And um, we're going to be providing comments to folks like NIST. You saw the talk earlier about all the things that NIST has on its plate just in the MPC space. Well, we are a forum for providing common feedback to the community. We have about 50 members right now. They are split between what I'll say broadly is the security group, the data privacy group, the mix and the others of those groups. There is a fair amount of blockchain distributed finance fo MPC folks. There's a whole bunch of privacy preserving MPC folks. We are worldwide. We have members all over the place. Here are the logos of all of our current 52 members. If you see your employer on this screen, you are a member of the MPC Alliance. And if you're not on the, ma on the mailing list and doing MPC work, contact me and I will get you on the appropriate mailing list and get you invited to our meetings. If you are working for a company that does work in MPC or cares about MPC or thinks MPC is cool and might be useful in the future, and your logo is not on this screen, you should be asking yourself why it isn't there. And the answer is, come talk to me and I will put a membership form in your hand and you can go take that to the powers that be that write checks inside of your company for doing things like this and we will get you on board because I'm looking to grow the organization. We do have um, institutional members that come from academia, but we are primarily uh, open uh, you know, for companies that are doing work in this space, and we are open to any company that has an interest in multi-party computation. So please, if you're doing work in MPC, or you think you're going to do work in MPC, or just kind of think it's kind of cool to go around and say, hey, I like MPC, 
come talk to me. I'm here through the rest of crypto, or you can send me mail at ballot mpc-alliance.org. Please do not ask me why the website is mpcalliance.org without a dash, but the email is. I can't explain that, but that's how to get hold of me. Or you can always send mail to treasure at iacr.org, and that'll get to me anyway, because it all goes to the same place. All right, that's all I got, and I'm within time. Thank you all, and I hope to see many of you at future MPC Alliance sorts of things. Thanks very much. Well, uh, hello everyone. My name is Jae Young Kim, and I'm a research engineer in a startup named Crypto Lab. Uh, we are mainly focusing on like fully homomorphic encryption. And today, I'm glad to introduce our new service called Auto FHE Vision, uh, which is a privacy-preserving machine learning service. So to start with, so what is Auto FHE? So Simply speaking, it's uh, auto ML with fully homomorphic encryption. So there could be a users who are not really familiar with like I either machine learning and fully homomorphic encryption. And uh, we, we are making a service so that users can easily use them. So currently we are supporting like automatically choosing uh, hyperparameters for machine learning. And uh, one of our goals is to extend it to the fully homomorphic encryption so that um, we can automatize the choice of fully homomorphic encryption parameters as well. So uh, let me briefly explain uh, the current version of our auto FHE vision. So, uh, so, so what we are actually doing is uh, fine tuning uh, in a privacy preserving manner, but um, currently only for uh, visual images. So this is an implementation of the slightly modified version of the Hetal paper, uh, which was presented in this year's ICML by members of our company. So like, let me, let me explain, be briefly explain the protocol. So we first have uh, trained data and uh, we use like pre-trained feature extractor to extract the features. Uh, and the client will get uh, features in a non-encrypted state. So they encrypt with a fully homomorphic encryption scheme and send it to their server. And once the server has this encrypted features, they will do perform some encrypted fine tuning on these features and possibly some, some like the short, some interaction between client and server so that we can choose appropriate hyperparameters for machine learning such as like running rates, uh, batch size, and the number of epochs, and finally get the fine-tuned um, model in the encrypted state and send it back to the client, and client can decrypt it and use for whatever machine learning application they want. So what I want to focus on is that it's really easy to use this um, service to build your own machine learning application. So it only consists of four um, steps. So, so the first step is to prepare your photos and label them means for classification. So in this example, it's uh, an example of tumor classification. So there are different types of tumors and um, photos inside it. And you then um, load your folders from your local device. You can easily see like which folders are loaded and the duration. And then you request machine learning while data is privacy preserved. And finally, check the security generated model and um, download it on your own application and service. Um, one thing to note is that you can also uh, do the model test um, and check, evaluate the quality of the fine-tuned model. And this can also be done in an encrypted state using uh, encrypted inference. So uh, this is an experimental result from uh, the Hetal paper. So uh, this. This uses our Heron library, which has um, GPU implementation of CKKS scheme. And uh, you can what you can expect is that uh, for like common 
um, data sets like MNIST or C410 or et cetera, um, the, the, this fine tuning process takes less than an hour while maintaining the accuracy to be as accurate as the non-encrypted training. So if you're interested, you can um, simply go to this autofhg.com website. And we are also preparing for the uh, demo version and it's released to be soon. So you can reserve it if you want. Uh, thank you. All right, at last year's RUMP session, I presented on some work in progress. And this year I am very pleased to announce at long last the release of Shell LL version 1.0. Shell LL is a pure bash implementation of the LLL lattice reduction algorithm. It uses only shell built-in functions and none of those standard POSIX utilities like cat or sed. Now, if the only thing you care about is performance, you're better off using Flatter or FPLLL, but ShellLL provides the usability, readability, and maintainability that you can only get from a 500-line shell script. That said, implementing things in Bash comes with its challenges. For example, uh, the only numeric type is string, containing the usually decimal representation of a signed 64-bit integer. But not to worry, Bash has arithmetic expansion that we can use to take those strings and pretend that they're actually integers, as you can see here in this GCD function. Uh, we take those strings that we're pretending are integers and we concatenate them with commas. Ta-da, we have vectors now. Of course, we need to implement all of the standard vector, vector operations, such as scalar multiplication, addition, and subtraction. Uh, and that's just integers. Of course, we also need fractions, uh, uh, dot products as well, sorry. Uh, we also need fractions. This is a function that reduces a fraction to lowest terms. We need this because without it, the numerators and denominators will immediately overflow. With it, instead, the numerators and denominators almost immediately overflow. Uh, the correct thing to do here uh, to avoid overflow is, of course, to implement big ints and big rationals, which I have not done. Uh, but as long as the lattice that you're reducing is dimension, I don't know, five or less, and the entries are smaller than, say, I don't know, 30, uh, it probably won't overflow. Uh, and now that we have rationals, we can make rational, uh, okay. I know what you're all thinking. You've implemented fractions. Why don't you just implement floats? To which I say, if you would like to implement a floating point library in Bash, uh, please send me a patch. I will be very happy to merge it. Uh, all right, we have rationals. Now we can make rational vectors where we use colons instead of commas uh, to avoid getting mixed up. We have only one denominator at the beginning instead of denominators for each of the components. Kind of a weird choice in retrospect, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Just like implementing LLL on Bash is kind of a weird choice in retrospect, but seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and now that we have our rational vectors, we need to functions uh, such as conversion from an integer vector, uh, reducing to lowest terms, scalar multiplication, addition, subtraction. Uh, and this function I want to pause and appreciate for a moment. Look, look at this, really savor it. This is a level of readability that you can get in very few other languages. This function, of course, computes a dot product of two rational vectors. Just try to imagine what it would take to implement this in any other language, and I'm sure you'll see the appeal of using bash. But we're not done. Uh, we, of course, need uh, projection coefficients, projection onto a vector, projection out of a vector, uh, zero comparison. And now we get to the interesting stuff. Whoops, too far. Yeah, now we get to the interesting stuff. Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Uh, we have a helper function, Babai's nearest plane algorithm, size reduction, a function to read the matrix in at the beginning, and finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, L, L, L. Oh, oh, we're not done. I've just made you sit through 35 slides containing roughly 500 lines of bash. This is the rump session. We're gonna have some fun. It's time for a live demo. All right, uh, we're going to reduce the following five by five matrix. Uh, 10 points to anyone who can tell me where these vectors came from. Uh, so this is, okay, it's not actually live. I'm sorry, this is a PDF. 
Uh, but I'm going to advance. I, I just like pasted the output from my terminal. Uh, and I'm going to advance the slide and time it such that we can all pretend that it's live. OK, so pretend with me for a moment. Here we go. All right, and there you have it. Feel free to run uh, FPLLL to check for yourself that this is correct. All right, I think this work raises, uh, I think, one in particular huge open question. I think this is really a case of scientists who were spending too much time worrying whether or not they could to stop and ask why they would bother to do this in the first place. And uh, at least me personally, I really hope that I someday figure out the answer to why I bothered to do this in the first place. Uh, but until then, you can find the code online. Uh, this is real. Uh, you can actually run this. Uh, feel free to check it out. Thank you. Hello? Ladies, gentlemen, cryptographers of all genders, we at Simula URB are ecstatic to announce that we are making crypto cool again and bringing back Arctic Crypt. It's going to, thank you, thank you. I was unprepared for that level of enthusiasm. Thank you very much. It's going to be organized in Longyearbyen, Svalbard, 2025. Yes, that is 2025. Why? Because Longyearbyen is very, very pretty. It is also kind of inconvenient. So if you're wondering where it is, well, it's in Svalbard. If you're wondering where Svalbard is, well, it's roughly there. So it's between the North Pole and Norway. If you're still wondering where on earth this is, literally, uh, this is also a reference. We are roughly like here, in case you're wondering. Uh, so it should go without mentioning that this is a pretty cool place. Uh, in fact, it is much cooler than Santa Barbara. Sorry. Uh, just look at these weather forecast temperatures. In Longyearbyen tomorrow, there will be seven degrees Celsius. Santa Barbara will have 31. And don't worry, for those of you more used to nonsensical, uh, sorry, non-Celsius, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit, we also have these numbers. So not only is Longyearbyen way cooler than Santa Barbara, there is also going to be lots more sun. How is this possible? Do you ask? Well, the thing is, this far north, the sun will never set, my friend. The night, the midnight sun is going to shine high, high, high in the sky. And if you don't believe this photo from New Olsen, which is another city in Svalbard, you can look at this pretty picture from Arctic Crypt 2016, which is the last one. And if you don't believe this picture that was taken around 11, according to my reliable sources, you can seek out the general chair of crypto, which appeared to have attended this very conference. Now, for those of you who have sought out this conference, crypto, in the search of, you know, tropical storms, maybe a hurricane, maybe an earthquake or two, I am sad to say that this will most likely not happen in Svalbard. However, there is a non negligible chance that you will be mauled by a polar bear. So, I hope you save the date, save all your best results, and I hope to see many of you in Longyearbyen in 2025. Thank you. Hi, um, another non-funny talk. I'm sorry for that. How do we move? Okay, so we're going to talk about FHE.org. For those who don't know what FHE.org is, it's a community of developers and researchers which are passionate about fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, all the aspects of fully homomorphic encryption from research to implementation, use cases, and so on. So FHE.org is uh, two sites. We have a conference and a monthly meetups where everybody can present their, their works related to FHE. And we also have a Discord where there is daily conversation about FHE. So please, if you're interested in FHE, join. And especially if you have a new interesting paper on FHE, a new result, an implementation, a use case, and you would like to present it, please get in touch with us because we, uh, we would love to see your presentation after our meetup. Okay, <clears throat> so FHE.org organizes a conference every year. The first one was last year. It was a one-day event um, affiliated to your crypt in Trondheim. 
And the second one was this year affiliated to a, a real world crypto in Tokyo, also a one day event. Uh, so we had really great feedbacks uh, uh, from uh, the talks, the invited speakers, um, the poster sessions, uh, and uh, all the discussions that happened then. Uh, but most importantly, we had great parties. And uh, with parties, I mean we had music, we had uh, um, open bars, great food, and an actual DJ. So if you want to see the cryptographers that uh, you look up to uh, getting crazy on the dance floor, that's the place you want to go to. And uh, if you missed it, uh, next year it's going to be, again, the same thing. So yeah, next year we're going to repeat the experience. There's going to be the third edition of FHE.org, which is going to take place in Toronto. Uh, as affiliated event as with Real World Crypto 2024. So instead of having a one-day conference, we're going to have a two-day conference next year. And we're going to have, again, uh, amazing talks, um, posters, invited speakers. But this year, we're going to also see uh, working groups, uh, tutorials, roundtables, and uh, many, many interesting conversations. So if you are uh, passionate about FHE.org, FHE, you should be there. And of course, we will not miss the chance to have, again, a nice party. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you uh, in Toronto next year. And thank you so much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Apparently there's a laser on this. Okay, hi guys. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some upcoming changes uh, for ISDR. Um, these are changes because of the disclaimer, this is not real. I had some people ask me and this is not real. Um, so anyway, uh, if you guys don't know me yet, you know who do you think of when you think of cryptographer, funny, and blue hair? That's right, I am Allison Bishop. <laughs> Yes, I, I took that photo the other day. Um, <laughs> so about me, if you don't know me, Allison Bishop, I'm a kind of a big deal. So I'm the founder president of Proof Trading, and I'm also the former crypto chair and founder of ICR's hottest new workshop, CFAIL, submit your papers, um, submit your failures, I'm sorry. Um, but most importantly, I am the ICR vice president, which means that I am a person with authority to make changes around here and changes I shall make. So, you know, there's been a lot of problems lately. And so first on our list is some problem solving. I know how all of you really hate how coffee keeps getting taken away between the breaks. <laughs> so to solve that, we're just not gonna have coffee. You can't take away what you don't have. Easy. <laughs> also, like, don't you like sort of hate communal bathrooms? Don't worry, we're not gonna have the bathrooms anymore. Each room will be equipped with a large tub of hand sanitizer. And, you know, I've heard some people say that it's sort of hard to get to Santa Barbara. And to that, I say, try me. So located in an occupied region of Georgia is the world's deepest cave. And within this cave, crypto will still be hunting Santa Barbara, but the pit Santa Barbara. <laughs> this is from National Geographic. Um, I hope you guys are ready. Yeah, so now that we've solved all the problems, let's move on to enhancements. Let's make this place better. So first off, um, you know, sometimes talk can be a little stale. So now they must all be sung. Who doesn't love a musical episode? And we're also gonna reduce conference fees with the small caveat that you will now be required to hunt and forage for food. And to discourage phone use, because you know, sometimes like you see someone's on TikTok or whatever, we're now replacing auditorium chairs with exercise bikes. You guys, you know, be healthy. And finally, um, to determine best paper, because we get so many great papers, we're gonna determine by foot race between the authors. I hope you're ready. And so do you have thoughts about these changes? Well, unfortunately, I will not be taking questions at this time. Um, but you can contact me at hellyvision at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone.
I do not endorse that message. Uh, but we're going to take a break. We are running a little ahead, so please pay attention. That we'll start. Uh, we'll start a little early. We'll start at ten o'clock. All right, we're going to get started again with our final session of the rump session. So, okay, thank you for being that numerous so late. So, um, okay, I'm sorry, it's not a funny talk, and actually it's not even my talk, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Leo Duca and other people, so I will do some uh, PowerPoint karaoke, I don't know how you call that. Uh, I even have my text here. So, um, yeah, uh, so. Okay. Oh, okay, now it works. Um, yeah, so I'm speaking on the behalf of Leo Duca, Iman Postelweiss, and uh, Jana uh, Sotavka. Ah, sorry. Uh, and I will uh, just read you some uh, text about uh, Salsa Verde versus the actual state of the art. So. Uh, as you may have read on the print uh, during or during the affiliated event, there was a paper claiming that machine learning uh, attacks on some latent problems, namely LWE and actually LWE on some very custom instances, uh, which are either very sparse or either have very large modulus. Um, so while this paper does report that LWE estimator uh, is kind of complicated to use, uh, it's completely dismiss the use of the LW estimator and instead choose to compare uh, their result with FPLLL using direct uh, unique SVP attacks. Okay. However, uh, the LW estimator is actually a very great tool and the paper uh, fails to point uh, what the attacks could actually be used and what is the actual state of the art concerning lattice reduction. So uh, the authors of this talk 
uh, propose to fix uh, this comparison table and uh, show you what is supposed to be the actual state of the art with lattice reduction. Currently. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, they implemented a meet in the middle attack uh, on the first parameters and uh, they could solve it in 10 minutes. That's actually pretty impressive. Uh, and they're still implementing the rest of the attacks since it will appear only print at one point. Uh, but the, for the biggest parameters, they could solve that in basically less than a day using a unique SVP uh, with isotropization, which is standard uh, technique. Sorry, that's very cheap. And nothing is answered. Uh, something uh, which should be pointed out is that uh, this Salsa Verde uh, is actually presenting some uh, wall time, whereas we would like to have the uh, CPU times because they're using a lot of CPUs. And if you compare, uh, then you should add a factor which is basically 200 or 500 more uh, because of the number of cores which are actually used for uh, this huge GPU computation. So, yeah, to summarize, uh, Verde is several order of magnitude behind the state of the art of lattice reduction and even on very custom-made instances. Um, all of these scripts are actually available already, uh, and they call that very funnily or not, human LWE, and it's a branch of the leaky uh, LWE estimator, so if you want to play with it. So once again, big disclaimer, I'm not involved in that. Uh, if you have any remarks, questions, uh, whatever, contact uh, Leo Ducat, uh, Ducat, CWI.nl. And uh, if you want to interact with the author of your paper, please contact Christine uh, Barantich, they have new results too. So, thank you. All right, so for, for this next talk, uh, I was supposed to finish the editing for the CFAIL music video before CFAIL on Saturday, but in typical fashion, I failed. Um, and so I asked for a little help from some of my friends here at Crypto to finish the music video, and I would like to play it for all of you.
Um, hi, uh, this is a serious talk on a paper that's uh, joint work with my uh, PhD student, Leah Rosenblum. And in fact, Leah prepared this, um, these amazing slides uh, and was supposed to give the talk, but at the very last minute, they couldn't. So that's why I'm doing a little bit of PowerPoint karaoke here myself, uh, but not much karaoke is needed because these slides really are amazing. Okay, so what is this talk about? Um, okay, apparently you won't be able to see these amazing slides. All right, there we go. So, um, so once upon a time, there was a very mean, very bad adversary, um, which wreaked havoc in the proof land by messing up provers in the middle of trying to compile, to compute their proofs. Um, so this is uh, a, an amazing drawing, in my opinion, of this adaptive uh, adversary corrupting a prover in the middle of computing a proof. And so the prover needs to um, relinquish its random tape. And so you're, if you're a prover, of course, you can do it. But if you're a simulator, you need to make up the random tape that a real prover would, would have had. So that's an additional challenge. So adaptively secure proof systems are uh, much more um, challenging to um, uh, to design than regular um, zero knowledge proof systems. So the poor provers suffered greatly until one day the very wise, very great global random oracle offered a solution. Um, so practical non-interactive zero knowledge proofs of knowledge secure against the adversaries fiendish adaptive corruption forces. The Oracle's worldly hero, Sir Straight Line Compiler, compiled valiantly until all of the remaining very honest, very good provers were saved from having their precious random tapes rapaciously raided. Um, so I, I'm gonna pause for you to admire the beautiful drawing. <laughs> um, and um, since the Oracle's magic and Sir SLC, that's it was Straight Line Compiler, cunning makes the proofs universally composable, the provers can safely compute their proofs concurrently and are protected from the baddest villain of all, uh, which is the adaptive adversary, uh, which, the, and the metaphor for the adaptive adversary is climate change, where this environment decided that, that the, in, on the fly, who gets corrupted. Um, actually, no, that's not quite true, but the, you, you, you get where the climate joke came from. Okay, so, so, uh, the point is that if you look at the Sigma protocols uh, and you compile them just the right way with a straight line uh, compiler, which is a bit, which is uh, the original version was by Fishlin, but has undergone some modifications, but so somewhat modified Fishlin compiler, what you get is uh, universally composable uh, zero knowledge proofs in the global random oracle that are secure even uh, against adaptive corruptions. So rumor has it uh, that some of the proofs may also maintain security in the parallel alternate real realities of quantum proof land, but that's a tale for future work. All right. Right, I have to use the clicker. It's late in the night. Uh, so my name is Mutu. Uh, Karmit Hazai and I, we have a startup where we are trying to build zero knowledge and multi-party computation tools. Today, we are, we are launching a product and we wanted to share it with our community first. So this tool is called MeshCal. So what is MeshCal? It's going to help you schedule meetings. I know you're tired of meetings, but this indeed is going to help you schedule meetings. So in very simple terms, it's going to help a group of people to find a meeting time where all of you are available and have maximal privacy. And we know what to use. I mean, this is one community that I don't need to pitch what MPC does over here. So our tool is called MeshCal. You can go to meshcal.com. You can try it today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more. If you click try it free on our, on our page, it'll go to a scheduling page. I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to walk you through how our product works. So it's two steps. In the first step, you're going to enter some basic meeting details. What's your title? 
of the meeting. What's your email to send back the results of the uh, availabilities? Who is attending? You can enter any number of people because we can handle any number of people. And when you want the meeting to be scheduled. This is step one. Step two, you have to provide your availability. And then you can send your invite and done. Now to provide your availability, you have two options. Either you're the kind where you sync all your appointments, like you know, you're that kind of disciplined person, you can just you know, sync your Google or Microsoft calendar and load your availabilities. But if you're one of those like me who, you know, who claims that I can have all my appointments in my head, you can just go onto the matrix and mark it like when is good or when to meet. And you send your invites and an email goes to all of the people invited and they can do the same. There'll be a link in the email, they'll click and provide their availability. But no matter how you provide when you're available, the MPC will take care that all your availabilities remain private. So this is the basic functioning of our protocol. It's free, you all can try it now. But I want to tell you a little bit more. Like, I don't know if you have seen, oh, and then you get the results. The scheduler gets the results once, uh, uh, you know, everyone provides their input. You can also create a personalized link. Like if you want people to schedule a meeting with you, I know there are tools like Calendly, I don't know, Chili Piper or like whatnot. But with this, your availability will be protected. All these other tools will share your availability. So if you want to schedule a meeting with me, you can go to meshcal.me slash mutu. Now, I, just reiterating the features, it's efficient, it's private, and when you want to schedule with me, you can add more people too to the meeting if you want to incorporate their availabilities. Now, what's more, all of you can already, like you don't even need to know our system, you can have a personalized link. It doesn't look too good, you just have to replace your email with your email address, and this link will enable anyone to schedule a meeting with you. Now, if you want, a better link that looks nice, then please come talk to either me or uh, Karmeet. Now, one thing I want to say here is that, you know, I know there are a lot of um, collaborators here of Yuval Ishai, and for those who are not yet collaborators, we thought, like Karmeet and I thought, we should do a community service and already provide a link for, uh, for Yuval. So if you want to schedule a meeting with him, this is going to help you. Okay. Last but not least, you have a startup, you want to you know, have a cool link to book a demo with your startup, or you just care about privacy and efficiency as like you know, everyone and every talk in this conference, or you're a PhD student, you want to schedule a meeting, your, your, your PhD dissertation with your committee members. Don't use when to meet or when is good. Use an MPC tool. Please go try MeshCal. Thanks. Hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you for still being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get ready for the uh, upcoming NIST threshold call. And the two main concepts to take away from this uh, brief uh, talk is that we have a threshold call and that we have an upcoming threshold workshop. Okay, so what is the threshold call? Well, there is a document that has been published in January with a draft of a call, and we hope to have the final version by the end of this year. It will uh, have a submission deadline that we're aiming for the second half of 2024. And effectively, what it's doing is it's calling the public to submit threshold schemes. Okay. And also some gadgets like building blocks that can be used for modular use. Um, we have two main categories. One is for selected NIST standardized primitives. And then the second one is for other primitives, not standardized by NIST. And this includes things like FHE, IBE, ABE, ZKP, etc. Um, a few notes about the call. What we're looking for in submissions are a written specification, a reference implementation that it needs to be open source, execution instructions to let the world execute as well, uh, experimental evaluation, and then also some license statements. Uh, we've already received 12 initial public uh, comments. Thank you to those who submitted. We're uh, taking them into consideration and we're going to incorporate changes in the revised version. Um, for example, uh, we will refine some of the subcategories of this call, including, for example, uh, room to submit threshold schemes for the recently uh, selected NIST, recently NIST selected PQC primitives. Uh, 
uh, there's a very wide scope in this call. In particular, we're interested both in pre and post quantum schemes. And for example, we also welcome uh, works from uh, that have been developed in other uh, standards development organizations. A few other assorted notes. The first one, really, really important to, to have in mind. We're um, positioning this as a gathering of reference material, not as a competition to select a winner. Um, whoops. Uh, we do expect the process that will ensue the submissions to clarify relevant system models, best practices, etc. And what we're aiming for is to, after a period of public analysis, to devise recommendations about various aspects of what we can call advanced cryptography and which include, you know, primitives about privacy enhancing cryptography and multi-party threshold cryptography. Uh, eventually, these recommendations may support future standardization processes. There's ample room for, for community participation. So, you know, please, uh, we hope you're available to give feedback, to make submissions and to analyze submissions that uh, others have made. And, you know, if you're interested in this area, it's now it's a good time to consider starting to organize a future submission. Okay, a few notes about the threshold workshop. Uh, we're going to have a workshop in late September, uh, 26, 28. You can still submit until September 5th. It's gonna be a fully virtual workshop with short presentations between five to 15 minutes each. It's free to attend upon a registration. And the type of content is not really like presenting research papers, but rather gathering comments from the community, either to improve directly the call document or to improve the process and to motivate community participation. So, you know, takeaway here is you know, come and just to hear or at least to share some technical nuggets of uh, wisdom. You know, if you if you have a particular, you, if you're well aware of a technical challenge, come and share that with the community. Uh, should you propose a presentation? Yes, you should. Uh, you can submit by September 5th. And here are some examples of suitable, suitable presentations. If you think you're interested in possibly submitting, then you should come and you should tell the community that you're thinking about submitting uh, a threshold scheme in 2024. Um, if you wanna give us suggestions on how to improve the actual call, please do so. Uh, if you are expert in a subcategory and you are aware of a technical challenge that usually the rest of the community ignores, come and share that knowledge. Um, provide other technical suggestions for the community of potential submitters. And even if you have already made uh, written comments across some of our previous uh, uh, publications. Feel free to come back and, and reiterate that for more community awareness. We have, I'm not going to go over this, but we have more topics of why you should, uh, of uh, possible presentations that we would welcome, you know, so check the workshop call. And just to finalize with a little tentative timeline, so we're going to have this workshop in late September. Uh, we hope to have by late 2023 the final version of the call. Second half of 2024 will be the submission deadline for threshold schemes and gadgets. Shortly after that, we will have one or two uh, workshops to characterize the submissions. Um, you know, we really need public participation for this. And then 2015 um, onward, we will eventually have initial recommendations about threshold schemes and then perhaps start new processes per subdomain, which may or may not include competitions or standardization or just recommendations for more fundamental research. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm here for a very short observation. If you were here in 2017, you might remember having RSNA on stage. It was cool. If you weren't here, too bad for you. Three years later, well, if you were here, too bad for you. Now, in another three years later, I have a new variation of this because last time, RSA brought crypto to you, but in Scandinavia 2023, RSA brings you to crypto. And I could have stopped here, but um, I got talking to the captain before boarding. And so as we flew across Greenland, 
I got a better photo up. And since I still have about 15 seconds, come to Arctic Crypt, and just minutes after that group photo was taken, Adi Shamir was hopping around on the stage with a rifle on his back, and I have photo proof of this. Okay, hello uh, everyone. Yeah, good evening. I have two minutes to introduce all the live digital synergy in the next fourth round post quantum yeah, cryptography yeah, competition. So here's the table to show all the submission. So see the other category, there are only one live curve system. Yeah, fortunately, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, all other submission are broken. Yeah, so we are going to our work free on the digital signature from ZK Snark. Yeah, here's my closer. Yeah, so pre is is uh, a, a ZK Snark based uh, <laughs> digital signature, and uh, we use the AES as a uh, one way function to build the, the digital signature. And the, 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 the a bunch of metric is that we use the binary field, total view. Totally, we get around the 100 bits up than original uh, Aurora. So here is uh, what the benefit we get. The benefit is that we can re uh, sorry hide more some information in the message. We don't need to reveal all the message. Yeah, and uh, it uses the standard R1CS format. So we have a lot of tools to write the program. Yeah, okay. And uh, here we are. We have the largest <laughs> signature size among all the submission. That's why we call it pre because we have we are the smallest digital signature in the net. Okay. It's been a very interesting year to be general chair of crypto. And a few people have asked me about it. So I felt compelled, shall we say, to share with you some key moments from this year. It was the week before crypto and all was in place. The strawberries were plucked, the shrimp had its fate. The papers were reviewed consciously and with care, and flights were booked in hopes to soon be here. The authors were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of isogenies danced in their heads. And the program chairs were planning for the seaside knowing that authors would timely submit their slides. When up from the desk, my phone vibrated with a clatter. I sprang to my inbox to see what was the matter. Through 10 weather sites, I toggled, not believing my eyes. In sunny Santa Barbara, could a hurricane really arise? 17 hours to replan outdoor events and reorganize. But at least I knew authors would timely upload their slides. Now a tent, now lights, let's move in high gear. Now a new dinner hall. Wait, was that disco ball always here? With Zoom testing in parallel to the weather backups, more rapid than rum talks, my inbox filled up. Questions on shuttles, volunteers, it's a blur. And then last minute registrations by wire transfer. 
So as the hurricane increased to a category four, as I replanned equipment, changed venues, and answered emails galore, I looked forward to crypto and talks about attacks from the side and thought appreciatively of the 102 authors who had timely uploaded their slides. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Puyan. I'm gonna talk about our uh, recent research on a primitive that has long been assumed to exist, but uh, there's a body story we're gonna see. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Juan Garay, uh, Ran Cohen, uh, Ruth Patel, and Vasily Zikas. So this primitive is, uh, is a constant time multivalued oblivious common coin, or OCC for short, and it's uh, nothing but the collective coin tossing where uh, each party uses its own local randomness and uh, they all, with the constant probability, they're all out with the same random value from a field. So now you may think that uh, this primitive, uh, this foundational primitive uh, must already exist especially in the asynchronous setting that randomization is necessary. And if that's the case, I should say that uh, you're not alone. And in fact, a number of papers, uh, including the seminal work of Benor and Yaniv on concurrent Byzantine agreements and all its follow-ups, that includes a number of MPC protocols, uh, even in the computational setting, relies on this uh, multivalued coin. But they mainly point to other sources uh, like Kennedy Rabin's uh, Byzantine agreement. But if you check those papers, you see that they only have a binary coin. And it's kind of funny that a number of papers from like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they uh, cited some unpublished manuscripts from 80s and 90s, making it very difficult to find those papers. But like those, uh, the uh, manuscript of Pelman. So we managed to find those uh, papers and uh, it turned out that even this hidden archive of cryptography doesn't have a uh, multivalued coin. So it's kind of scary. We're building uh, 20 or 30 years of research on a primitive that doesn't exist. But the good news is that we were able to construct this multivalued coin. And the central idea of our con construction is a new extraction mechanism that allows us to extract more than one bit. I won't go into the details, but at a very high level, at some point in the protocol, we get, uh, we, a vector of random value is fixed, and uh, due to asynchrony, each party has a local view of this vector up to t of these coordinates might be missing. But uh, we have this guarantee that uh, a linear fraction of these coordinates are uh, common in all the views of all the honest parties. So it was known that how to extract a single bit from this uh, local view, but uh, with, uh, using our new novel combinatorial observation, we were able to extract uh, more than one bit. In fact, we were able to agree on one of these coordinates with a constant probability in a non-interactive way. Uh, and that coordinate is among the that common intersection. So we were able to extract the value corresponding to that uh, coordinate. And this allows us to extract uh, anything from from domains from constant size to exponential size. So this is kind of significant. An immediate uh, application of uh, our multivalued coin is an asynchronous oblivious leader election. And this primitive alone has been used in a number of papers. Probably the most important one is the expected constant time concurrent asynchronous Byzantine agreement of the Northern and Leniv. Uh, so we were able to fill this gap in this, that paper we also find some other issues and gaps, and along the way of fixing those issues, we realize that we uh, can, uh, with some tricks, we can simplify their asynchronous solution uh, significantly, get something similar to their synchronous one. And this result uh, give us uh, asynchronous MPC in expected constant time in the computational setting in the plug and play way, and also with some small tweaks, 
we can get uh, expected constant time asynchronous MPC forcing the number of parties in the information theoretic setting. Uh, although this void in the literature is uh, filled now by our work, the adventures continues. So as I said, our coin uh, allows for sampling from a, a arbitrary size domain. So we may be able to do this randomization uh, beyond this phase king style uh, randomization that's common. Uh, that's an avenue in the protocol design that we can uh, explore. And uh, the other thing that I want to say is that our result is a feasibility result. So uh, there should be some room to improve the efficiency. And our paper is on Ethereum. Thank you. Thank you. Forward after Blazor. All right, hello everyone. Uh, so I guess before becoming a grad student, I was a security consultant for a few years, which meant that it was my job to look for interesting vulnerabilities in popular software packages that you're probably familiar with. All right, slide two. CryptoBib is a popular software package that you're probably familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, you really should be. It's a, it's a great tool. So what CryptoBib does is that it compiles different bib tech references for all sorts of cryptographic papers. And it makes it really easy to cite them. Uh, and it creates a bib file that makes it really easy to do reference management. So um, Mira and I decided to look at this and see if we could find any interesting vulnerabilities. And what came out of this was Clout Bleed, which is a vulnerability I'm here to present to you today. All right, so Cloud Bleed uh, works uh, by exploiting a property of CryptoBib. So let me explain to you what CryptoBib is. So we have our researcher down below, and we have all of academia above. So the researcher reads these interesting papers, and they find the one they find the ones that they want to cite. CryptoBib takes these papers and they compile a .bib file. This .bib file is re-uploaded to GitHub where so this bib file contains all of academia this bib file is sent to the researcher which they download from github and then they can use this to create their paper which they re-upload to academia uh, which gets reincorporated into cryptbib and uploaded onto github uh, and then sent back to academia and then uh, all the way back so it's all up to date and i hope this is clear all right so what we're looking at is if an adversary uploads something to ePrint, that's not what's expected by CryptoBib. So let's say you go to ePrint and you see this paper with a special author name. All right, so what happens here is CryptoBib will take the HTML of ePrint, it'll convert it into a BibTeX entry, and because of the special characters we insert into the author field, the BibTeX entry is actually parsed in this way. So the preamble com comment on the second line means that include this latte command in every single paper that uses CryptoBib. So let's say you have a paper that uses CryptoBib, which is the crypto cross reference, and they compile it, and all of a sudden, your latte is now included in the paper. All right, so what can we do with this? Uh, we can input your private keys. We can write to any file that's in the current directory. And if the correct compiler flags are set, you can run arbitrary commands. Now, when I made these slides, I assumed that no one would set the compiler flags to run arbitrary commands, but I guess after Kevin's talk, it's not no one that sets the compiler flags to run arbitrary commands, so that's probably not good. But okay, none of this matters. We don't care about this. What academia really cares about is references. So this command right here is why we call this issue clout bleed. So this command will insert whatever name you want before every other author in the references. So this exploit is a way to rack up your citation account by tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands. All right, this leads us to the very natural question of has this ever been exploited in practice? Hmm. 
Now, okay, could it be that they're just really good researchers who do great work and have been doing this for several years? Maybe. I'm not there saying they're not, but I'm just saying we don't know, you know. All right, and no vulnerability talk would be complete without a discussion about responsible disclosure. All right, so we found this issue on November 2nd, 2022. This talk began a few minutes ago. We disclosed this issue, and now the talk is over. Thank you, guys. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Yushin, and uh, again, this is a serious talk. And uh, I'm going to present this paper about uh, ordering transactions with bounded unfairness. And uh, this is a joint work with Agnes Kiaias and Nikos Leonardos. Okay, so transaction order, it is important in blockchains with smart contracts like Ethereum. And it is known that the sophisticated users can manipulate the transaction order and again profit. So we have this MEV, which stands for maximum extractable value. And uh, it just describes the loss of the honest users uh, from the reordering attacks, like front running attacks and sandwich attacks. And uh, you can see that this chart, which illustrates the uh, huge amount of, of uh, the uh, money loss. Okay. And uh, to mitigate this uh, uh, MEV attack, uh, there are several solutions, one of them is to, to force some uh, ordering policies in the consensus layer of the blockchains. And uh, one direction of this is to implement this receiver order fairness. And it mainly says that the output of the blockchain should be based on the local view of all the honest parties. And uh, we have a very natural uh, receiver order fairness notion, uh, which is based on the majority preference. And it mainly says that if the majority of the system maintainers, they see a transaction before another, then in the final output, they show the output of this transaction that precedes another. However, unfortunately, it turns out to be that this very natural notion is impossible to achieve when under some circumstance, for example, there exist uh, condorcet circles. And uh, this condorcet cycle, that is, that is a concept from the social choice theory. And it mainly says that the individual preference can be cyclic. So you can see here, there's an example. We have three parties and three transactions. And uh, for the majority preference, you can see that transaction one is preferred by uh, preferred before transaction two, and two before three, and three before one. And this implies no order will satisfy this natural receiver order for n. So given the fact that uh, we, under some circumstances, we have to order transaction unfairly, Sorry, that's a typo here. So it is unavoidable to order transactions unfairly. So here we ask the question, if uh, we can minimize the number of the transactions between any pair of uh, transactions that violate the fair order. And also in the state machine replication pro, uh, area, this question translates to the, the following question. Can we minimize the number of the unfair state updates according to any given transaction? So to answer this, uh, we first propose this unfairness metric, which is measured by the number of the transactions between any unfair, any pair of unfairly put transactions. And we'll, we also propose this new fairness notion, which we call it bounded unfairness. And it aims at minimizing the transaction, minimizing the transactions between any unfairly put transactions, which means that we want to minimize the state transaction before an um, unfair put transaction, and this implies that we also minimize the opportunity, the opportunity for this transaction to be front run. So here we have uh, an illustration. The left side is uh, about some transactions, and the arrows means the majority preference. And on the right side, we have two different orderings, and we prefer the, the above one because it has the unfairness here, which is illustrated by these back arrows. They are more bounded compared with the below picture. So we prefer the, the first ordering because it has bounded unfairness. So just a quick summary of our paper. In our paper, we have definitions. We formally define the transaction serialization with bounded unfairness. And we also have, uh, sorry, 
We also have complexity, which we analyze the complexity of uh, uh, achieving this notion. And it turns out that it, it is closely related to a graph theory problem that is a uh, graph bandwidth. And also we have uh, constructions where we propose a new permissionless blockchain protocol that not only satisfies the safety and the liveness, but also, also satisfies the optimal bounded on fairness. And uh, the paper is available on ePrint now. Yeah, and if you are interested, uh, please take a look. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. All right, I'm back. And I'm apparently standing between you and the end because they decided to give me the dubious honor of being the last talk. I know it's just you, I know. You're getting back at me for various board meeting shenanigans, but that's okay. You want me to go over time. I, 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 I can arrange for that to happen, okay? Your wish is my command. Now, here, here's the thing about this. This isn't my work. I'm the stucky. I mean, I'm the designated presenter because Roberto and Orr and a whole bunch of people couldn't be here. And so they sent me this PDF and said, Brian, would you please get up at the rump session and present these slides? And I kind of flipped through them very quick and I just saw that there were like five of them and they seem to have text on them. And so I don't really know what's coming. So we're all gonna kind of discover this together. So this is called Carmageddon the competition and uh, I'm the spot apparently, okay. And we're gonna go through it. La Macchia actually does mean the spot in Italian like a macchiato. So I guess they're being fun. Um, it's a competition to break a tweakable block cipher, Karma V2. You have probably seen Karma to past FSE. Uh, Karma V2 is a redesign. It's in the public domain. There's no IPR. Here's an ePrint reference. That's great. We can all go there. Maybe it's got a funny bibliography in it. We don't know. Um, there are two pieces to the competition. There's a 64-bit, a 128-bit with an SBIT key. There's also this pointer and memory architecture one that I think gets used in some ARM chips. But you can go read the paper on the last slide and kind of go look at it, but there's a competition. Um, or it's a selection process if you're NIST because we don't have competitions officially. Break as many rounds as possible. Go after both the 64, the 128 bit versions. Now, Roberto kept telling me that I had to pronounce the Hebrew cough letter as, huh, okay? And I think he was just punking me through this. So that's the cough, but that's actually an S box that's defined in the spec. Um, you can consider other variants, crypt analyze stuff. You got to get in them by a month before FSC 24. There's your jury. I can vouch for the first two that they set me up for this. Okay, as for the rest, um, here's your submission format, uh, standard ICR format, don't worry about Kevin's stuff yet, normal paper. Um, there's a jackpot funded by arm of 10,000 United States dollars um, to be divided among prize winners. Uh, they're gonna depend, they're gonna get prize out based on how many rounds you break and some tiebreakers and things like that. And wait, there was something else here somewhere. There was something where they said about prizes. What? Yeah, I guess divided by, there was something on here about, they changed the slides on me. Oh no, here it is, here it is. Feel free to consider other variants. The jury may consider extra prizes, honorable mentions, pralines, and this notable one, the hummus. And I want to talk about the hummus because when these guys bring the hummus, they're serious about it. And I don't know how many of you were at Hummus Crypt 2023 earlier this year, but I was. I was even, you know, part of the jury tasting the hummus. And when they put the hummus on the line, it's really serious. Okay. Hummus Crypt was timed so that Orr could get hummus from his favorite hummus store and take it in a bag to the plane directly and get it to there. Anyway, that's it. Oh, oh, I didn't talk enough. Okay, okay, I'll keep talking. Have fun with the competition. Go go attack it lots. Go send it in. I'm going to keep filling up time here until we get off and I get played off. There we go. I think we should hear more from them, don't you?
All right, so we have some rump session prizes to give out, mostly to all of you for making it to the end. So give yourselves a hand. Uh, what I would like to do here, because I seem to be conflicted out of a few of the contenders for the rump session prizes, I would like to give two awards here from the rump session chair and then make some nominations to be considered by the program chairs and the general chair uh, to give out the other two. So uh, we, have the, we have these lovely shrimp awards here. One is a golden shrimp, one is a, a clear shrimp, and one is a, a red shrimp. Uh, the, uh, the uncooked shrimp and the cooked shrimp and the golden shrimp. And then we also have a rump session Oscar, which is very nice. Um, so the two awards I would like to give to the chair, I would like to give the uncooked shrimp, just because it's white and sort of the black and white style of the drawings, uh, to the uh, Tales in Proofland which I think is an amazing innovation in rump session art. No, it's not for you, it's for, it's for Leah. <laughs> please, get, please give it to them. Um, and then I would also just like to make an honorable mention because she can make her own shrimp if she would like, uh, but Britta Hale for the week before crypto, um, I don't know why, because my memory is kind of hazy before 2023, but it really hits home for me in some way. Um, so I think that's a wonderful tradition for the general chair to share that kind of poem at, at the rump session. Um, but I would like to make a few nominations for the best rump session talk, and then I would like the program chairs and the general chair to consider these while we kind of give you some background music for their determinations as well as the the prize for the um, for the title, um, so the ones I would like to nominate for the best rump session talk include the Chat GPT perspective on the IACR review process. Um, yep, thank you. Let's clap for each nominee. Uh, I will exempt myself, but I will I will submit Alexis Korb for the Barbie themed "I'm Reject" song. Adam Schul for the Shell LLL. Uh, Issa Lee for impersonating me quite accurately. I wouldn't take away the coffee though. I am addicted to coffee, but the rest is on the table. Um, and the attack on CryptoDB, or sorry, not CryptoDB, but the, uh, the citation attack that we just saw. Uh, so I would like those to be considered for our remaining two awards once our uh, prize from the game is given out. And so while they are deliberating on that, we will give you a little musical interlude. Oh. 
Um, pero no. So I don't actually have the program in front of me. So uh, okay. So um, so uh, Keegan Ryan gets the cooked shrimp. <laughs> For breaking crypto bibs. <laughs> and the Oscar for the best rum session presentation goes to Alexis Corb and Allison Bishop for the amazing dance routine. <laughs> I mean, my personal favorite for the for an encore, but you're probably not ready for it, is the last year's use big O number. I don't know if, if do we have time for an encore, and I don't know if you I can do it, time. but um, I'm not sure you're ready for an encore. So, okay, well, think about whether or not you you want you want to do it. Uh, in case inspiration strikes, that that was awesome. Um, okay. So, and finally, the funny title based on what uh, the, the keywords that uh, we gave you. So the funny title is attempting to chain down a teleporting black hole sea fail in memory of our fallen co-authors. <laughs> <laughs> and the winner is Matthew Gray. Uh, since C fail was in there, I'll throw in a C fail t shirt for this year if you find me tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so that concludes our ramp session program, unless Alexis can find the file to do. Yeah, all right, we're checking. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going to take a two-minute break, and we're going to try to do an encore performance here. Hold on. Good. Purple, purple's on. Yeah, this will be the last thing. Oh. <laughs> we're doing an encore of her song last thing. Uh, let it go. You speak up. You speak up. Yeah, we're going to do it together. Yep. <laughs> Is a log term bothering you? I know I'm trying I'm gonna try to fix it for her. I'm gonna try to edit a version that has the that has the MP3. Yeah. 
Anna, I, I have a uh, I have a comedy film premiering at a festival in LA next week. Wow. So that's my uh, my video editing has now progressed, but it started in Brunswick. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess some feel the transfer from crypto to, to comedy, which doesn't pay well either, but you know I'm gonna be I made a mistake by running the tight and ending up Yeah. I, uh, I'm not Yeah. Yeah. All right. We have, we have an encore musical performance for you from last year's rum session. So this will be a rendition of Alexis Korb's Use Big O, which I will join her in singing. All right. All right. So, you know, oh. <laughs> Yeah, this is from last year. All right, so you know, as a theoretician, sometimes you know you have. Uh, all right. Hmm. Next slide. <laughs> okay, there you go. You have a nice result. Woo! And then people are like, "Wait, but what's that little like asterisk thingy in the corner?" And you're like, "Oh well, you know, uh, that. Uh, yeah, it's maybe sort of, kind of not really very efficient." And then it turns out people kind of care about that, and uh, they're like, you know. Why should we care about your work? What's the point? Why do we give you money? And you know, like, what do you say to this? So here's one thing you could say. Think staring blankly off into space, no computer to, to be found. Because I'm a theoretician and my mind is the playground. But then the real world dumps my paper in my lap and asks, but can you implement this crap? Look, I don't, don't know, know how could I know. I know. We lost concerts like 14 papers ago. This construction fell from, from a history. history. Uh, leaving out the sea. You, you speak on. You speak on. No constants anymore. You speak on. You speak on. I don't, don't care what's the paradigm that is fast enough to cool as long as it's poly time. It's funny how the. Oh, sorry, no. So everything seems small. Like physical restrictions, cost energy and all. It's time to see, see what I can, can do. do when I can send a distinction of obfuscation into you. you. When that is fast, so when it's free, so free, so free. So of term bothering you, put, put it to me on the O, and away that goes to Here I stand in my crypto land. Every viewer's rage. <laughs> My quad is to slow for normal ups. 
The sun would die out long before its runtime ever stops. <laughs> but though you claim it's not efficient at this cross, we're asymptotic here. Your N is just too small. He's big O. He's big O. And uh, never, no. <laughs> And I forgot the words here. <laughs> I don't, don't care because this paradigm does this path does this fast enough. School as long as it's polypine. <laughs> All right. Well. <laughs> Light timing was a little off. This must have been the older version, but 